Wonderful. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our presentation today uh, titled, um, excuse me, sorry, <laughs> our, our feature presentation today, Social Policies, Fathers and Child Wellbeing. Uh, my name is Laura DiMarcantonio. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions and Recruitment here at the School of Social Work. And I'd like to introduce you to our, uh, our prime speaker today, Dr. Lena Napamanyashi. And she is an associate professor here at the Rutgers University School of Social Work. Um, a little bit of her background, uh, her research interests are broadly focused on how poverty, inequality, and social policies impact child and family health and well-being. Uh, one line of her work examines the impact of social policies, particularly related to fathers and child support on the well-being of families and children. Another line of her work examines socioeconomic and racial and ethnic disparities in child health and development. Uh, and I know that Dr. Nepom Nyeshi has a little bit more information to share about her background as we get started today. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to her. I will just mention we have a Q&A going. We also have a chat. I'm going to be monitoring that to, uh, throughout our presentation today. So feel free to type, type in any immediate questions. We'll either address them as we go along or certainly at the end. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to talk about my work and thank you all for coming. I'm so excited to know that um, people are interested in this work and I hope someday we all can see each other in person. That is something to look forward to. Um, before I share my slides and, and go into the talk, I wanted to introduce um, a little bit just more about me, just a little bit about my background and then I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I uh, got my MSW actually here at Rutgers many, many years ago, like 30 something years ago. And I was in the track that used to be called community organizing, planning and policy. I can't remember what it's called. It's, it's not the same name. And so then I was a school social worker actually for about 10 years um, after getting my MSW. And this is where I started to begin obviously in our work, right? To understand what is going on with people in the world and how the policies that we learn about in class are actually being felt and experienced on the ground. And the, the issues that when you are working one-on-one -on -one with families and, and kids, I was working with high school kids, you see kind of the same issues coming up over and over again. And at some point I had to step back and say, what is going on here? And and I started to understand that the importance of context, the importance of policies, the importance of discrimination, the importance of poverty, inequality, racism, all of these things that impact all of our clients on a daily basis and how those are the things that I wanted to focus on. And so I went and got a PhD at um, Columbia in New York and um, in policy research. And that was kind, that's kind of where my work has gone. Um, and I'm just gonna now, I'm gonna share my slides and continue from there. And it should be coming. And I am hoping you are seeing slides. If not, someone should scream at me. So just quickly, this is the agenda, the introduction I've started. I'm gonna talk about the overall project, some context of fathers, children, and families some summary of our findings and then next steps. And I welcome very much questions at the end. Um, if there's like super clarifying questions, um, please, uh, you can put them in the q and I mean, actually put your questions in the Q&A the whole time. Um, the, before I move on, I just wanna again, kind of talk about what motivates everything that I do in terms of research, but also in terms of my teaching. And I'll, I'll show you that slide in a moment. And here's what drives all of my work. Um, the US is the wealthiest nation in the world, but on every measure, it doesn't matter what measure you take, we have the richest um, economy, the most rich people, <laughs> et cetera. We by far are the wealthiest nation. However, we have the highest levels of child poverty and I'm focusing on children, but I could put in any age group there, the highest level of elderly poverty, the highest level of working age poverty, et cetera. And also the highest levels of things that accompany poverty, such as food insecurity, hunger, homelessness, child maltreatment, all of these things that are part and parcel of economic deprivation. We also have the highest levels of inequality. So again, we have these incredibly, incredibly uh, large numbers of the highest, highest wealth holding and incomes of in the world really. 
And not surprisingly, we have just tremendous disparities in health and well being, and really in every kind of outcomes that we as social works workers care about by socioeconomic status and by race ethnicity. And social policies, in my view, and in many people's view, have the potential to address all of these issues. We know how to address all of these things, but why, why have we not addressed them? And I, I want to make two kind of, this is what I do across my teaching, across my research. These are the kind of the things that I focus on, that most of our policies were established on the basis of racist and discriminatory ideologies and on the basis of you know, racist origins of this country. And there's a lot of really great books that have come out over the last um, couple of years, really honing in on this issue that many of the things that we take for granted in our policies were really created based on, um, on, on a racist view of this country of who should have things and who should not have things. Um, and then also we have underinvested in many policies and most policies that can improve well-being across all these populations. So that's kind of what drives me. And this is reflected in my research, which um, Laura read off. Um, again, I, I focus on poverty, inequality, discrimination, how they affect well-being, and then how policies interact with these things and how do they affect poverty and equality and do they promote or do they inhibit well-being? And I focus particularly on children in single parent families and lower income families. I look a lot at fathers and the role of fathers and policies around fathers. And just in general, I use quantitative methods um, and I analyze large national data sets. So I don't really do qualitative work where I talk to people, although I think that is incredibly important. That's not my training and expertise. And in teaching, um, I teach a poverty and equality discrimination and public policy course, which I hope you will all consider. It's an elective course for all MSW students. It's offered in the spring semester. Um, maybe some of you here have taken it. And then in the fall semester, I teach the ACP, Advanced Contemporary Policy Economic Justice course, which you can choose that course amongst other advanced policy courses, but it's required. So you have to take at least one of them. And I'm sure you probably already know that that's in your fall semester of advanced year. Um, and I teach in the PhD program applied um, regression analysis, which is a kind of an advanced statistics method. Okay, so I'm going to start with the specific project that we got funding for a few years ago um, through the William T. Grant Foundation, their Reducing Inequality Initiative. And also we got some other funding through the Fatherhood Research and Practice Network. And our big question here was, can fathers um, reduce inequality in children's outcomes? So fathers and low-income children's academic and behavioral outcomes, and then the role of social and economic policies. That's the overall question. And I have um, my team members there. We had uh, co collaborators across other universities, uh, some postdocs that were here and have gone elsewhere, and then a bunch of um, PhD students, MSW students. I've only listed ones here, but there's been a bunch from other schools as well. Um, and then the specific questions in this project are, can father involvement reduce inequality in outcomes between children in low and high income families? And then what is the role of social and econ economic policies in promoting or inhibiting lower income fathers involvement in their children's lives? And I have a list of policies there, so I'll come back to that. But first, I want to set up what is going on in our country with specific um, with specific impact for lower income families and lower SES families. I'm gonna use that, those terms a little bit interchangeably. So there have been major social and economic changes over the last four decades. Um, Deindustrialization, loss of manufacturing jobs, declines in union density and increases in incarceration rates. These are all also policy driven, right? If you start to step back and think about this. These major social and economic changes have resulted in dramatic deterioration in the economic prospects of lower educated men and men of color. And when I speak about men of color, I'm talking specifically about Black, Latino, and Indigenous men. And as I go through, I'm going to show you some pictures of what I mean here. But as I go through all of this, one thing that's really important to keep in mind is when I talk about lower educated folks, I'm talking about people without a college degree. And keep in mind that only one third of Americans have a college degree. So then obviously two thirds do not. And it's about even between men and women, although men are a little bit lower um, in terms of having a college degree, but it's about a third. And so keep in mind that as I'm talking about this, I'm really talking about 
almost everyone, right? Two thirds of people in this country are being affected by these changes. So let me show you this first chart. I think this is one of the most important charts. I showed these in, in both of my classes because I think it's, it's really a key piece that explains so many things that are going on. And, and you know, maybe we can talk about this later in the Q&A. So this chart shows the change in earnings in um, median weekly earnings of men and women by educational attainment between 1979 and 2018. So I think how many years is that? 30, 40 years, I can't really do math in my head. And what this graph shows, right, is that between 1979 and 2018, um, the dark blue bars are men, the lighter blue bars are women. Men with the highest level of education, so bachelor's degree or higher at the bottom, their earnings increased by 19%, almost 20%. And that's the only group of men for whom earnings increased over this 40 year period, right? If you look at people with just a high school degree, their earnings have declined by 18% over this period. And for the lower educated men, those with just a high school diploma, their earnings have declined by 25%, right? That's something we need to think about and, and think about what are the implications of that for all sorts of other things, right? And this is where I'm gonna go with this talk about thinking about what does this mean for families? What does this mean for children? What does this mean for communities? What does this mean for men in general, right? This is another chart that I think is actually also very important. So this is a little bit more complicated. I'll explain it. Um, this is a chart looking at the cumulative risk of incarceration over a lifetime. So this is, what is your risk of having an incarceration experience over um, a lifetime? This is for men ages 30 to 34 and for different cohorts. So for the men who were born in 1945 to 49, that's the group on the left, you see that the risks of incarceration were quite low then. That's the first thing to notice. And as we go across the um, axis to the left, to the right, sorry, um, these are more young men, right? So we end on the right with men born 1975 to 79, which is the most recent cohort. And then the different lines are all um, all white males, that's the green solid line, um, white males that are high school dropouts, which is the dotted green line, all black males, which is the purple solid line, and African American black men with a high school dropouts, and that's the dotted purple line. And so the thing here to see is that in the, there's several things. The first thing is cumulative risk of incarceration has increased tremendously mostly for black men, but also even for white men with a lower level of education. But if we look today for um, black men who have dropped out of high school, their cumulative risk of incarceration by age 30 is 70%, right? So 70% of men born between 1975 and 79 um, who are 30 to 34 um, and who are black and who are high school dropouts 70% of them will have an incarceration experience. So again, this is absolutely a product of policies. I hope you understand that. And you know, in our classes, we talk very much about this. So not surprisingly, and this is again, I want us to think about what this means for families. These dramatic declines in the prospects of lower educated men um, has been linked to declines in marriage, and increases in divorce and non-marital childbearing. So again, here's another chart that I wanna show you. And so the takeaway here is, so this is the growing marriage gap, and this is now women. And so th this is over from 1968 to basically today. And we see that for everyone, the percentage of women, this is 40 to 45 year old women who are married has declined, but then you see differences by education level. And again, th what I wanna show you here is at the, in the 60s, the difference between the highest educated women with a bachelor's degree and above and the lowest educated women, which is the dark blue bar did not finish high school was just a five point difference. Um, the lower educated women, 80% of them were married compared to 85% of the highest educated women. Look at today. What we see today is that the highest educated women also decreased in marriage rates, but they're at 75%. The lowest level education women have marriage rates of 55, right? That's a 20 point difference. And so again, this is the growing inequality and the growing differences in people's experiences 
all based on socioeconomic status. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm making the case that a lot of this is related to men's um, earnings and men's wages and men's incarceration rates. And then one other picture I'm going to show you is the percent of mothers who are unmarried. So this is a non-marital births. Um, and the big takeaway here is again, this is um, non-marital birth rates by education of the mother. And we see that for moms who have no high school diploma, 61% of them, their first, their child that was born, their new, their, these are new mothers. So their first was a mother versus mothers with a college uh, degree, only 13% of them. But even look, those who are high school degrees, 57%, right? Well over half of those new mothers um, had a child without marriage and 43% um, of those with some college. And again, remember, where are most Americans, right? Most Americans are in these three groups. This is only a third of Americans. So again, these economic and social contexts that have changed have dramatic implications for people's family lives. And so the next point I wanna make is that all of what we just saw has very serious implications for children's living arrangements. So who are children living with? Who are they spending time with? Who is contributing to their well-being, and what's happening to them? And so today in the US, because of what I just showed you, a quarter of children live with just one biological parent and most often the mother. And this is more than any other country in the world, which is something I actually <laughs> didn't realize until I was doing a talk a few weeks ago. And because family processes are so dynamic, right? Fam fam parents get together, they break up, they form new families. Actually half of children will live in such um, a family over the course of childhood. So we're not talking about just a small group, right? We're talking about um, probably more than half of children in the US will spend some time living with just one parent. Um, and I, I, from here on, I'm gonna start using gendered terms because I study non-resident fathers most often. And please keep in mind that absolutely there are many children who live with a father and they have a non-resident mother. There are children who live with neither parent. There are children who live with grandparents, right? There's all sorts of things, but the overall overwhelmingly large proportion of children who live in single parent families are living with a mother and with a non-resident father. So I'm going to speak gendered terms, but keep in mind that there are other ways to think about this. Um, and of course, not surprisingly, there's large differences by education and race ethnicity. And so let me show you a couple more pictures. So this is children's living arrangements by parents, race, ethnicity. And so the takeaway here is that amongst white children, 17% of them live in a mother only family, but over half, 55% of black children live in these families in these type of families, 31% of Latina children and 38% of indigenous children. So again, very large differences in family circumstances by race, ethnicity, and the next slide, by education. So again, I'm gonna bring in education here. And even we see even bigger differences actually by level of education. So 60% of children um, of parent, children of parents without a high school diploma live in a mother only fam family compared to 15% of children of parent with a college degree or more. But again, I want you to look at these other levels of education, right? We're not just comparing the most advantaged to the least advantaged. Even among those with a high school graduate who, whose parents are a high school graduate, more than half, right? 55% of those children are living with a mother only. And even amongst those who have some college, but not a fully, they didn't finish college, 42% are living in these circumstances. So this is the most common now, <laughs> in some sense, um, way for children to be living. And we need to think about what that means. And not surprisingly, children's living arrangements have important implications for their economic security. And this is actually, again, what drives most of my work. I actually am not all that concerned about the fact that children live with a mother only or a father only or whoever. I actually think people can make choices about where they wanna live. What I'm more concerned about is what happens to the economic security of those children? And can we do a better job of ensuring that those children are stable, secure, home, home, homed, <laughs> housed, and not hungry, regardless of who they live with? And so just quickly wanting to show you poverty rates for children living with two parents and 
living with the mother only family. And so again, children are much more likely to be poor living with a mother only compared to two parents. And we of course shouldn't be surprised, right? Because when you live with one parent, you have one income earner, obviously, right? So of course you're gonna be more likely to have lower income to be poor. And often because we have no universal childcare in this country, many mothers can't even work at all if they have to stay home and take care of children, right? So think through what these processes are about. And then again, just one kind of last picture here, um, large differences in poverty rates um, amongst children living in single mother families by race and ethnicity. So amongst children living with a mother only, amongst white children, 32% of them are poor, amongst black children, 43%, and amongst Latina children, 48% are poor. Okay, so let's kind of step back again and think about um, what, what is the questions here. So again, what's driving this particular question is that children in lower SES families fare worse than their higher SES peers on pretty much every domain of well-being that we care about. And you know, this is this is something that drives my work. And then this uh, this new question that we have been working on is fathers are potentially an important tool to address this problem. Fathers can improve child well-being. And so we're interested in can they close some of these gaps and what are the role of policies? And first, I just want to go a little bit into thinking about why is it that children in lower SES families don't do as well as children in higher SES families. And there's really two processes that people theory, theoretically have discussed. There's the family resource policy, sorry, uh, pathway, and then there's the family stress pathway. And these are not separate pathways, right? They're completely connected because family resources certainly contribute to stress, right? So the family resource pathway says, um, you know, that there's access to resources that lower SES families don't have. And these, these resources enrich and encourage intellectual and academic growth for children, things like books and toys and activities and good schools and safe neighborhoods. And then there's things that are more kind of amorphous, like social connections, skills, knowledge, right? Like you want to apply to a college and your parents who are higher educated call up their friend who can get you into an interview, right, with somebody, that kind of thing. That's called cultural and social capital. And then there's the family stress pathway, which is that, you know, living in poverty and living in economic deprivation increases stress. And that kind of stress prevents, not prevents, but hinders families and parents from being the best parents that they can, that it affects the quality of parents, parenting, it creates less nurturing and intellectually stimulating environments. And as I'm sure we can all imagine what that's like to be, you know, consistently stressed all the time. And so let's now again, how does father, how might fathers work? So one way is the fathers can increase resources to children, right? Obviously, if the father lives in the house, he's contributing financially, I mean, certainly hopefully, and certainly not as much as he used to, right? Because of all of the evidence that I just showed you previously. Um, and also fathers who don't live with children, they provide, they can provide child support, they can provide all sorts of other things. But not just financial resources, right? Fathers can also give you non-economic resources. Again, back to those social connections, skills, knowledge, those are all important resources. And fathers can reduce stress. So again, raising children with two parents in the household where when things aren't going well, you can kind of do a handoff and have somebody else take care of things and help out there's just no substitute really for that. Raising a child by yourself is stressful, <laughs> I know. Um, and so working together, right? A supportive, supportive co-parenting is also very um, helpful. And so, okay, sorry, so let me go back. This is how we think the fathers can, can improve child well-being broadly. So quickly, what is father involvement? When we talk about fathers, what do we actually mean? And so we think about two ways. I think about this in two ways. Obviously, that's kind of simplified and simplistic, but just broadly. Um, so I think about social involvement, which is the quantity of time spent together, the quality of the father's parenting, and the types of things that fathers do with their children. Just the same things that mothers do, right? But different things. Um, and then the closeness between fathers and children. And then there's material contribution. So again, um, resources the fathers provide to family in terms of financial resources and non-financial resources. 
And then also in terms of non-resident fathers, we can think about specific types of support that non-resident fathers provide. And this is what I'm gonna focus a little bit more on because this is my, most of my research is on non-resident fathers. And so we can think about child support through the formal child support system. I'm gonna talk a lot about that, the child support enforcement system. Then there's informal contributions that fathers can give, which is when they just give money to children and mothers for whatever. And then there's non-cash support, which is when fathers provide not cash, right, but other things when they uh, buy things for, you know, buy shoes, buy diapers, buy clothes, pay for the doctor, pay for childcare, pay for camps, things like that. So I just want to again step back and think about how does all the stuff that I showed you at the beginning here matter for lower educated and lower income fathers. Um, so these economic and social changes, they've created a climate that is detrimental to lower SES fathers' ability to provide for and be involved with their children. That is what I'm making the case of. Low wages help hinder fathers' ability to provide for their families and support children in non-resident families. Incarceration obviously limits men's ability to be in the home and live with their children, but it also limits their accumulation of economic, human, and social capital, right? Because they have incarceration history, but then also when they come out, right? And this is called the collateral consequences of incarceration that even after they come back from incarceration, that mark of a criminal record never disappears. And there's some amazing books again that if I have time, I'll try to. Um, tell you about that are talk about this that have come out in the last couple of years. Um, and then increasing rates of single parent families, which I also showed you primarily among single mothers, limits men's ability to be involved with children and to provide for them financially, right? A father isn't in the home, he can't be with his child because he's not living there, right? Even when he wants to. And I also wanna say, I don't know if it's somewhere in my slides, I think it is, but all of the research shows all of the polling, like the um, political, uh, sorry, the opinion polling, the survey data all suggest that all fathers have a very strong desire to spend time with their children and to be involved in their children's lives. Of course, there are fathers who might not want to do that. We know that, right? But the ma overwhelming majority of fathers are very, very um, involved and committed to being with their children. Lower socioeconomic status, higher, resident, non-resident. This is kind of the same across all fathers. And of course, given the context that I just showed you, um, lower SES fathers cannot be as involved as they would like to be. So they're less likely to live with their children. They have fewer financial resources and non-financial resources. They have less access to opportunities to be involved with their children. And, and here's the, what I was saying, that all evidence points to very high levels of intent and to desire to be with their kids. And just quickly, a large body of research established the importance of fathers for child development and child well-being. There is lots of research showing that fathers are very important for all aspects of child development and child well-being. But older findings are less conclusive about low-income and non-resident fathers. The, you know, when I started in this field about 20 whatever years ago, it was very like, well, we don't know, maybe low income dads aren't good for their kids. Maybe non-resident dads aren't good for their kids. Because of very, very small studies that had been done in the past, much of that was focused on um, resident fathers and middle class families, mostly white families, just not representative of um, what families are now particularly. So more recent research, which includes um, national samples of low income, minority, unmarried parents, kind of the families that we have now show that um, social invo involvement, meaning time spent, um, engagement activities um, among low income and non-resident fathers is good for children. Some of my work has focused on that um, because, and, and let me just step back why, there's a new data set. Well, it's not new anymore, 20 years ago that came out that looked at these families more than anyone has ever um, looked at them before. It's 5,000 children born in urban areas over sample of children born to unmarried families. And that's where almost all of this research now is coming from on the importance of fathers and families. Um, the data set is called the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. If you look at any of my papers, you'll see the data there, but again, I can give you links to it later. Um, the other thing that has been found is that informal and in-kind child support is actually probably more important than formal support. 
all of, almost all of my research has found that formal child support through the formal child support system has not been good for children necessarily. And then qualitative data and people who actually do talk to families and children and mothers and fathers, they, this, these data suggest that mothers and children and fathers view informal and in-kind support as much more meaningful and as preferable to formal support in many cases. Okay, so now I want to talk about policies and fathers. I'm gonna go through this quickly. So the child support enforcement system is really the only program in the US that specifically targets fathers and children in single parent families. It is the only one. And if you go to their website there, I, I have their little mission pulled out, you know, establish paternity, obtain child support, encourage responsible parenting, child well-being, blah, blah. That, and their explicit goal is to transfer funds from the non-resident parents. Again, I'm gonna use fathers because that's how I think about these families and that's the research I do, to the resident parents, so the mother and child. However, there is also an unstated implicit goal. Um, this policy is supposed to reimburse the state for the cost of public assistance accessed by the child and mother. So that is the other issue here that I'm gonna say a little bit more about. So broadly, the overall problems here with this, with this um, policy system is the program is not designed to support the economic well-being of non-resident fathers, right? It's designed to transfer money from them and it's designed to pay back the state. A very small proportion of children in single, fam single parent families actually receive any child support. And here is where, this is the case that I'm going to make that the system is highly punitive, particularly against lower income men and families. And the system is highly racialized. Families of color are highly overrepresented and are thus you know, uh, being penalized by these policies much more so than white men. Um, so just very quickly, the child support enforcement system, there's three steps. First, you establish paternity if the parents are unmarried, which is probably the largest proportion of families in the system. Then you establish a child support order, so an obligation, how, how much should the father pay? And then you collect support. And almost all the support that's collected, about 75% of all the things that are collected come through wage withholding, which is when um, they just go into the father's paycheck and take it out. So it just goes through his social security number and it just comes out of his paycheck. So overall, there's about 14.3 million children that are served, 13.6 million cases. And whenever you people talk about child support, people who are, who are supporters of child support system will say, it is the most effective program we have, the most cost effective, sorry, cost effective. For every $5 of support collected, we only spend $1. So let me re-say that. For every dollar we spent, we collect $5, which sounds good. But then I want to push us to be questioning what is the best way to evaluate a policy. And so then let me talk about some of the inequities. So how do you enter the system? So the most, most mothers enter the system involuntarily. So if a mother is on public assistance, she must cooperate with child support enforcement in order to receive assistance. So if a mother applies for TANF, the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families Program, which is our main welfare program, or Medicaid, she must cooperate. And what that means is she must turn over the name of the father to the system. And this creates some very strange and, and you know, kind of harmful situations, right? Because in, in many of these cases, mothers and fathers may be living together, but now she has to turn over his name to the child support enforcement system or else she can't get benefits. So in all states, um, all TANF and Medicaid uh, applications have to do that. In 23 states, if mothers apply for child care development fund, which is child care subsidies, also have to cooperate. And in seven states, if you apply for SNAP, which is um, the food stamps program, supplemental nutrition assistance program, you also have to uh, cooperate. So again, only a very small proportion of families enter voluntarily into the system. And what I wanna make sure people understand is that for families on public assistance, only a small portion of the support the fathers pay actually goes to the family. In over half of the states, none of the money that the father paid is passed through to mothers. It is all taken to recoup public assistance costs. Okay, a couple more inequities. Um, so establishing an order, right? We have to find out how much did the father pay? So every state uses different formal formulas, but primarily based on father's income. And these punitive, these policies are very punitive and damaging. 
um, and they differ across states. So first, the first thing people states often do is impute income. If the father does not show up to the hearing, if he's unemployed, if he can't provide documentation of earnings, um, they just impute his income, meaning they assume they give him some made up amount. So you, you know, whatever, you work uh, at the minimum wage every day, all year. And in most cases, research has shown that these imputed income um, estimates are way overestimates of his ability to pay, particularly for low income men. Then there's something called retroactive orders. So what they do is once a mother say applies for a public assistance and then they go after the father, um, they will set the amount that he owes back to the birth of the child, even though perhaps the father had been living with the child, perhaps the father had been contributing all that time. Perhaps the child is 10 years old, it depends. Um, they sometimes can set it back all the way to the birth of the child, which means that fathers have these huge debts out of nowhere that, that they have to pay. And then also in some states, they add Medicaid birthing costs to the obligation. So if Medicaid covered the child's birth, that might be added on. Again, you can imagine that's something like $10,000, right? Just being added on. There's no automatic modification of orders during periods of incarceration or unemployment. So again, remember, we talked about what is the cumulative risk of incarceration for low education um, black men, something like 70%, right? This is, these are experiences that are almost universal for some groups. And the modification processes in general are very cumbersome and require legal representation. And so you can get this order, but you can never change it. And so these policies create unrealistically high child support obligations, which are basically often unpayable. Um, a couple more inequities I want to share with you. So many non-resident fathers have difficulty paying. I'm, I think I've made this case, right? Low incomes, incarceration histories, poor employment prospects, also complex families with children in different households and unrealistic orders. Overall, only one third of resident parents in the country receive any child support. 77% um, of cases have arrears, which is debt, child support debt. So unpaid child support. And so like big deal, okay, unpaid child support. But now I'm gonna show you, talk about what happens when people don't pay support. So interest on unpaid, un unpaid support begins automatically, often at very high interest rates. And if you don't pay or you underpay, there's a whole bunch of very punitive things that, that start to fall into place. So you can lose a driver's license, you can, you, there's public shaming, they can seize your tax refunds and there's felony charges and incarceration, right? So this like this incarceration piece keeps coming up again and again. And let me just talk a little bit about arrears, this child support debt. So I, as I said before, 77% of all child support cases have arrears and there's something like $117 billion owed nationally. And this research shows that 75% of people who owe arrears make less than $10,000 in income, 60% have no income. So this is considered basically uncollectible. But let me show you, when I went to the child support website, um, I just wanted to get some information. This is what they had on their website and they were very excited about it. It was like, oh my gosh, in 2020, our arrears with this $117 billion, the amount of arrears dropped unexpectedly to $113 billion. So somehow $4 billion of arrears got paid and they were really proud of this um, decrease in arrears, which every, and you can see the chart in the orange, arrears have not moved for many, you know, they're, they're continuing to go up. You see that big dip in 2020. What happened? Yes, somebody just wrote something and exactly right. Um, why did this happen? Well, because the pandemic relief checks came for non-resident parents who owed arrears and they were seized by the child support enforcement um, system. So, okay, so let's think about this for a moment. Um, on the one hand, we think like, oh yeah, no, that's good because children who are obviously um, need money are getting this money from these fathers. But the other thing to keep in mind is that almost all of these non-resident fathers actually have new families and they are living with new children because that's what people do, right? They repartner, they have new children. And so those checks were actually going to the new family as well, right? And so then those children have now been deprived of this very important relief, right? That should have been going to that family. So these are very complicated issues, right? So now I just wanna spend a little bit of time look, talking about some of the work that we have um, found in our, the, this project. 
So the first thing is um, in this paper in Social Service Review, the role of fathers in reducing socioeconomic inequalities and adolescent behavior outcomes. We found that fathers' engagement with children, so doing all sorts of activities with them, and provision of in-kind support, so non-cash support, was associated with fewer behavior problems when children were 15 years old. We found no effects at all for child support, for formal child support provision. We found this for that was true for both lower and higher SES fathers, and for both resident and non-resident fathers. And kind of the big takeaway here is that we do this kind of statistical simulation where we find that if you increase involvement among lower SES fathers, we can substantially reduce or eliminate SES gaps in children's well being. So we can close the gaps between children in higher and lower SES families. So that was one paper. Another paper looking at very similar kinds of issues, but focusing now on child academic outcomes. So uh, math scores, reading scores, and grade retention. And we find a very similar answer. The father's involvement was associated with better child academic outcomes and higher involvement among lower SES fathers can close SES-based gaps in reading and math scores and in grade retention. And this was true for both resident and non-resident fathers. And now I wanna to turn just to, for the last few minutes to policies. So I think I made the case, I hope I made the case, that the child support enforcement system is not a policy that's really gonna help um, many families. And certainly, I mean, some, right? There are certainly children who will receive child support and that's great. But amongst many families, the system is set up really as a punitive and damaging system. So we wanted to look at other policies, all sorts of other policies to think about what else could be helpful. And so this is, we're still in the process of doing this, but there's a few papers that have come out. So one paper looks at Head Start. Um, and Head Start, for those who don't know, is an early childhood education program focused on low-income children. And one of their big things that they do is they focus on parent involvement. That is one of the you know, kind of major things of the program is that they, parents are encouraged to be involved. And so we found that fathers of children who participated in Head Start were more involved. Um, th and this is non-resident fathers. So fathers who were not living with their children Nonetheless, if their children did uh, participated in Head Start, the fathers saw their children more, they engaged with them in more activities, and they provided more non-cash support. Um, another finding about the minimum wage, this is one paper about the minimum wage and fathers' residence with children. We found that um, higher minimum wage was associated with a higher likelihood the fathers lived with children. We have another paper that's in progress looking at the minimum wage and fathers' contributions to children. And it's complicated, so I'm not going to go into that yet. <laughs> We're not ready to talk about that paper. Um, we also have a couple of papers on fathers and incarceration and barriers to reentry. So overall, we're not the first people to find it. There's many papers. Incarceration among fathers is bad. It is very bad for children in every way. Um, it's, it's lower child support. It's less involvement. It's all sorts of bad things, more hardship. Um, and also in our paper, we find that incarceration, again, not surprisingly, increases father's child support arrears. And then we looked at some barriers to reentry policies. So we looked at ban the box policies. And I think some people probably know what ban the box is. That's where when you go to an interview for an employee, like <laughs> at an employer, um, on the first application, there's a box that says, have you been convicted or served time? And the thought is that, you know, if you check that box, you are going to be automatically discriminated against and they will just throw your application out. So many states have created a ban the box policy where you're not allowed to ask about that on the initial application. You can have later conversations about it, but on the initial application, they're trying to get rid of those boxes in order to get people into the door. So the people who are coming back from incarceration have at least a foot in the door and the ability to make their case. And so what we found, and again, we are not the first, we, but we confirm these findings is that actually, ban the box policies increase discrimination against black fathers. And this is, you know, this is in a society that discriminates against black men from the beginning, when you're not allowed to ask about um, incarceration history, employers seem to just kind of make a blanket assumption that if you're black, that probably means you had been incarcerated and they toss the applications, right? Even when the ban the box. So th this is like one of those unintended policy consequences that need a lot more thinking. We also found, however, on the other hand, that restricting public access to criminal justice records actually may help fathers. And we found evidence that it helps all fathers with better employment opportunities and more child support. So again, very complicated. 
And then this is a paper that's just about to come out. It's actually embargoed, and I, but I'm going to talk about it because <laughs> it's about to come out. We find um, the question, the, the uh, paper is about parental debt and child well-being, and we look specifically at different types of parental debt, both mother's debt, father's debt, and then father's child support arrears. And the data set that we use is the only one that actually measures child support arrears. And what we find, first of all, is very high levels of arrears among non-resident fathers, particularly those in the lowest income strata, very high arrears. And we find that these arrears, this child support debt, is associated with much worse child behavior outcomes than any other type of parental debt. And so this is something that we are really worried about. Um, and these associations get stronger as children get older. And remember, I want to point you back to the evidence I presented earlier that 77% of cases in the child support system have arrears, right? Um, and just quickly, a couple other papers that other people are doing also. Um, we have a, actually me and a student, at, a PhD student at Rutgers, we have a paper looking at state income tax credits and father's involvement with children, and it's still in progress, but it looks like if there's more generous earned income tax benefits, there's more um, non-resident father engagement with children. And then this other, um, uh, Lindsay Bullinger, uh, another researcher who's doing really cool work, she's finding that Medicaid expansion, you know, so some states expanded Medicaid um, during the ACA and some chose not to, um, Medicaid expansion and men's access to Medicaid was associated with increased child support receipt for children. So summing up, I want to leave time for questions. Father's involvement with children is associated with a substantially improved outcomes for children across SES strata, across racial ethnic groups, and regardless of whether fathers live with their children or not. Child support enforcement system, the only policy that's targeted towards fathers, appears to be punitive. It creates highly unequal, racialized, and potentially harmful effects, particularly for lower income fathers and fathers of color, and does not effectively serve most lower income children. And we, as social workers, who care about people, who care about disadvantaged groups, right, um, need to advocate for policies that will improve lower SES fathers and mothers, everybody's, access to higher wages, more stable jobs, health care, increasing children's access to child care, reducing incarceration and barriers to reentry. All of these policies, obviously, are not just going to help fathers, they're going to help everyone, right? They're going to help families, they're going to help mothers, they're going to help communities. And so these are the types of policies that we should be thinking about, and often also universal policies, not just those targeted at lower income groups. Um, and we think that these policies will improve well-being for all and promote racial, economic, and social justice, which is um, the mission of the social work profession. So I'm going to stop, and um, hopefully we can engage in some questions. I think I should stop sharing. Laura, what do you think? Sure. Um... So, and thank you so much, Lena. This is um, your, for sharing all of the work that you're doing. And I can tell you, I've been monitoring the chat and there are a number of uh, individuals who are also um, extremely interested in these important issues. And thank you everyone for chatting and making comments. Um, we did have a couple of questions that perhaps I'll just go back here to the start. So Maria asked, uh, do you have uh, information? What are the poverty rates for children living with a father only? I think you shared uh, mothers. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't have that in front of me. I know that it is also much higher than two parent families, but it is lower than mother only families. So I think the mother only family I showed is like 36%. I wanna say the father only families is maybe like in the twenties. So it's not great. <laughs> but it is definitely lower than mother only families. And often that's because men make more money, right? And also what we know from some research is that when men, when children live with a father, they're generally living also with his family. There's not that many fathers who live with just a child. Often there's like the grandma or somebody else. And so there's just more people in the household. But that's a really good question. Uh, Brittany asked, is there any research on the differences of outcomes in sons versus daughters concerning a father's presence and perhaps varying at the level of socioeconomic status? That's a really good question, too. And I would say in general, the research is somewhat mixed. But overall, I think the story is that boys do worse, um, that boys are more harmed by um, not harmed, that they're more harmed by poverty, particularly in single parent families that um, there's a tiny bit of evidence, and it's not super strong, that boys seem to do worse than girls in these situations. Thank you. 
Uh, and Patricia asked, why is it mandatory and not voluntary for the mother to give the name, the father's name to CSE? Uh, it seems it could be conflict, conflicting. It's totally conflicting. And remember, the reason is that the system was set up to recoup public money. So that's, that is the main goal. That's kind of an implicit. It's not the goal that they put on their website. It's, but that is the underlying goal of the program was to uh, claw back the money that mothers get from the government. Again, it's this thinking, right? That um, people shouldn't get uh, help if there's a parent out there. But you know, this is something we talk about in my classes a lot, about who gets actually help in this country and who profits from the government and actually um, people at higher levels of income get much more money from the government than poor people across all kind of programs. That's a different conversation, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and Marie is interested in how, your opinion on how could ban the box policies be improved? That is a really complicated question. And um, I mean, you know, we, we live in a, in a racist country. Um, you know, black men are discriminated against at a higher rate than any other group. Um, so I, I, so I don't know if we can do anything specifically about the ban the box uh, policy because it's you know if people don't have information they're going to form whatever information they want to form right and they're going to use that information whatever way they want i would say the general the bigger the bigger answer to some of these problems is to stop incarcerating people okay that, that seems obvious but um to have jobs that are given incentives to hire people who have um incarceration history so actually there are some programs like that and i believe in some of the biden stuff that has been proposed, there are some more programs created to um, increase employment amongst these, um, amongst people who are returning from incarceration. I want to also quickly say, I didn't talk about this, but we know that we have some of the highest incarceration rates. I mean, not some, we have the highest incarceration rates of any country in the world. Um, and people are coming out, right? And so the, the people that are something like 6 million people are coming out of jail on a regular basis, right? So this is like a major issue that needs to be addressed because all of these people are hugely disadvantaged in the labor market, obviously. Uh, Catherine asks, are there such policies that are entering into the government that need more support and backing or do these policies not yet exist? Um, I'm not sure which policy. I, I think we were... Catherine, I, I can actually, let me see. Catherine, I'm uh, asking you to ask live if you'd like to. I've uh, unmuted you. You can unmute yourself to ask. There you go. Hi. How are Hi. you? Can you hear me okay? Hi. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know if I just didn't ask the question correctly, but um, I'm much more of a clinical social worker rather than like a management and policy one. But when I do find certain policies, like I on a government website, I had a project to do. I tend to go for, you know, bills and stuff that are helpful <laughs> in this situation. So do you know of any bills that are being proposed that like I could hopefully support or let people know I'm like interested about or anything like that? Yeah, that's a good question. So do you mean New Jersey specifically, or do you mean at the federal level? Uh, a little bit of both. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, I don't know what's happening in New Jersey right now specifically around this, but I mean, there's a lot of stuff that is being talked about. So, um, you know, the fact that we have a new administration at the federal level, right, the Biden administration, they have a very different way of thinking about this whole system than the Trump administration had. And actually, during the Obama administration, they had created some improvements that had already started to go into effect. For example, I think somebody wrote about this, they allowed states to pass through um, as much um, of the child support paid on behalf of mothers on public assistance than in the prior uh, years. But some states didn't adopt it. That's the other thing. Some states continued to take all the money back. Um, so there, there's small movement like that. I would say the biggest thing right now that we should all be thinking about, and this is not necessarily related to fathers, but it's related to families. So of course it's related to fathers, is the child tax credit that is part that was part of the American Rescue Plan. And families should start receiving checks in July, July 1st. Um, these are $300 checks per child. Um, and three, 250 for children over six, 300 for children under six, 
for each family in America, right? Um, it, it's going to be amazing, but it's only a year. And so they want to extend it. So that to me is the most important thing that is going to, I mean, all of the analyses suggest that that tax credit alone will reduce child poverty by over half and for black families by something like 60%. And so that is the most important thing right now, um, I think to focus on, because that will seriously help children and all families, obviously. Okay, thank you. It was a beautiful presentation. Oh, thank you so much. So we have a two-part question from Demetrius, uh, and I will just see we've got about four minutes left, so we'll try and get through all of these. Uh, Demetrius asks, how does the child support continue to justify its current policy when most cases are in arrears? Uh, and then he also asks, why is time spent with children by non-resident parents not included in court mandates when uh, appropriate? That is a great question. That is something that we as researchers who do this work are constantly fighting for. Um, we absolutely think that um, father's time with children should be counted, right, as, as something that children are getting from fathers, certainly not in-kind support. There's some, there's a couple of tribes, I think, tribal um, governments that are experimenting with giving fathers credit on their child support if they provide some stuff, like whatever, right, diapers, formula, whatever. Um, so there's some thinking about this, but, you know, these are really it's really hard to change these kind of policies and mostly because there are very old school conservative ways of thinking about this, right? That these people did this and they need to pay, right? I mean, that I'm being crass, but that is actually the, the general conversation, right? That, this, that these men did this and they need to pay even if it puts them in jail, right? Even if it doesn't actually provide any benefit for anyone. And when you go to these meetings, which I've gone to many, you still hear those same people say that same stuff. <laughs> it makes you want to vomit. So yeah, it's just, it's a problem. I mean, there are certainly people who have great ideas and I think there's more of that going to happen in this administration for sure. Um, you're muted, Laura. Nicole said that uh, you had mentioned some books in the beginning um, on the influences of yeah, racism yeah, yeah. and what they what they meant to social policy. Can you name a few or maybe put a few in the chat box? I'm putting it in the chat right now. So Heather McGee, who is an awesome person, she was the uh, director of Demos, which is a big dem democracy promoting organization. But now she does something else, which I can't remember. Um, her book is called The Sum of Us. And that's the beginning. Then it's like the cost of racism for everyone or something like that. And her whole, the, um, her whole, uh, what's the word? Theme, theme, is that the policies that we have that are hurting everybody, right? Like the fact that we don't have um, healthcare, the fact that student debt is so high now because states and the federal government have invested so much less money in, in education, higher education uh, funding over time. It's all because I mean, it's not all because it is often because when the civil rights movement happened and black individuals in America got rights to things, politicians pulled back because they didn't want black people to have these rights. And so now all everyone in America suffers from this lack of investment in public goods. And she gives the most beautiful example. And I have to tell this because it's, it's an amazing example. In Mississippi, after the civil rights movement, um, they went in and they cemented in all the pools, all of the pools public pools that were beautiful. There had been like this amazing building of public pools in the, the 30s, 40s, sometime after the war, 50s. And the moment the black people were allowed to use those pools, the government decided <laughs> no, right? And that's just, that's a metaphor, right? But it is what she makes the case happened across all of our social policies. It's a really compelling book and she's done a bunch of interviews. So if you just look her up, she's done podcasts with a number of people so you don't have to read the whole thing. And then, okay, that was one book. And then the, I think that's one of the most important books that's come out. And then uh, da, 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 Halfway Home, Half, Half, I can't type, Halfway Home, The Afterlife of Mass Imprisonment, I think, or Incarceration by, uh, Jonathan Ruben Miller, or maybe Ruben Jonathan Miller. He is a, at the School of Social Work in Chicago. It is an amazing book. It is about what happens when people get out of jail and how every single thing in their life 
is completely screwed, right? Like you can't go live with your mom because she lives in public housing and you're not allowed to do that. You can't go see your dad because he may have had a record and you're not allowed to talk to anyone who had a record. You can't go to your kid's school because they don't allow people who have a conviction near the school, right? And so on, that's just the beginning, right? Of every, every piece of our society um, works against people who are coming out. Sorry, we're over time. <laughs> We are, we do have a hard stop. Um, we do have two other questions. What I'm going to do is, uh, is jot you down and, and um, jot down your names and we will follow up with you. Uh, but I will go ahead and turn off our recording now. And I just wanna thank everybody for being here today. Um, this has been great. Thank you to uh, Dr. Nepal uh, And we are looking forward to seeing those of you who are new to the school. We're very much looking forward to seeing you this fall. Uh, those of you who are returning, we can't wait to see you too. Uh, it'll be good to all be back together again. So take care, everyone.